Okay. I think we're good. Um, shall we move on to the Office of Healthcare Affordability? Uh, well, I need to hear from the Department of Finance and the LAO. Of course. Department Madison of Madison Sheffield, okay. Department of Finance. No comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. LAO? Uh, hi, Corey Hashida with the LAO. Just have a few comments on this proposal. I'll be I'll be very fast. Um, uh, you know, on this proposal, we would just note that you know we don't have any major concerns to raise. You know, we find that the goals of establishing this, this new department, which are you know generally to establish a department with a stronger capacity for both research and evaluation of you know state healthcare workforce issues and affordability concerns, makes sense. You know, especially given the addition of the Office of Affordability. You know, furthermore, you know, we find that this office does actually present an opportunity for the legislature to hold the administration more accountable on issues related to health care access, you know, affordability and um, the collection of health information. You know, this is particularly the case for for workforce related issues. You know, although there are several different entities in, in the administration which which also work on these issues, um, you know, which indicate that the proposal wouldn't fully consolidate this responsibility into one department. You know, with this recasting, the new department, you know, would present itself as a central point of contact to the legislature for these issues, um, which may help facilitate facilitate some accountability um, to the legislature, especially in receiving evaluation materials of of workforce and affordability issues that the department, the new department, would collect information on. Um, so that, that's all our comments. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move on to issue number three: Office of Healthcare Affordability. Um, and I believe we're going to have uh, Bill Kramer, Executive Director for the Health Policy Purchaser Business Group, uh, Ryan Witz, Lauren Nolan Hijik, uh, Janice uh, Rocco, uh, Janice O'Malley, and uh, Yasmin Pellid. Mr. Kramer, are you there to start us off? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. And members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to offer comments on the proposed Office of Healthcare Affordability. I'm Bill Kramer, Executive Director for Health Policy at the Purchaser Business Group on Health, formerly known as the Pacific Business Group on Health. We are a nonprofit coalition based in California, representing nearly 40 large private employers and public entities. We strongly support the proposed Office of Healthcare Affordability. As all of you know, we have a serious problem in California. Healthcare costs are too high, creating financial barriers for patients to get necessary care. High costs also put a severe financial burden on employers, especially small businesses that provide health benefits to their employees and families, thus crowding out business investment, job growth, and workers' wages. This is not just about healthcare, it's about the economy, jobs, and wages. We know that healthcare costs could be lower, much lower, while maintaining the quality of care and access to needed care. Numerous studies have shown that the amount of unnecessary spending is nearly 20 to 30 percent. We also know that some hospitals and physician groups are able to provide high quality services at much lower costs than other providers. The Office of Healthcare Affordability presents a great opportunity to ensure that the costs of care are reasonable and affordable and thereby benefit all Californians. Other states have implemented or proposed similar offices or commissions, and the proposed design of California's Office of Healthcare Affordability builds on their experience. In my opinion, the California model is likely to be more successful. In particular, we believe that the proposed Office of Healthcare Affordability will be effective because first, its scope is broad, it's taking into account quality, access, and equity not just costs. Second, it will set appropriate targets with meaningful incentives for meeting the targets. And third, it will provide technical assistance to providers for help in meeting the targets. There's one element of the bill I'd like to mention that we believe should be strengthened. Uh, the role of the advisory board is very important to the success of the Office of Healthcare Affordability, and it's important that its members are acting in the interests of the general public. Specifically, the board should ensure that the interests of patients, consumers, and purchasers, those who receive health services and pay for them, are appropriately represented. I recommend that we find ways to ensure that the advisory board is acting on behalf of the general public and the public interest broadly. In summary, 
Californians are facing a severe crisis of health care costs, quality, access, and equity. I believe that the proposed Office of Health Care Affordability represents an excellent way to address that crisis. Thank you for your attention to this important issue, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have uh, after the panel speaks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And should I have asked, did the, does the administration want to speak first, or do you just want to go right to the panelists? Whatever, whatever Madam Chair's preference is, we're, we're happy to talk about uh, some of the changes whatever, in whatever order you prefer. Well, now that we're started, why don't we hear first and then we'll, we'll close with you. How's that? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Ryan Witz, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Ryan Witz and I serve as Vice President of the California Hospital Association. CHA appreciates the opportunity to testify here today because we know that healthcare affordability is an important issue facing California. Addressing this problem is no easy task. And while the Office of Healthcare Affordability, as outlined by a, uh, in AB 1130 and the administration's trailer bill, attempts to create a pathway for curbing the rising costs of healthcare, we believe there are critical changes needed if this proposal is to be both successful and sustainable. Outlined in today's agenda are three specific questions for CHA. And I'm happy to provide some insight during these remarks and also take questions when appropriate. First, as proposed, we are concerned that there could be detrimental and unintended consequences. For example, this bill suggests that the healthcare spending today is in the right amounts and is in the right places. As many acknowledge, COVID-19 has shown that current spending on behavioral health is insufficient for millions of Californians. In fact, this is also the administration's position as we've seen their budget proposal to invest more than $1 billion of behavioral health infrastructure and student mental health services. Under this proposal, these types of investments would only be implemented if other spending is reduced, forcing a choice between new beneficial spending and cuts to existing services. Second, we were asked to consider other models. Well, we've seen similar well-intentioned policy lead to unintended consequences under the Medicare's 1997 Sustainable Growth Rate Policy, the SGR policy. And even though the SGR was designed to control cost growth in Medicare payments for physicians, it however failed to ad uh, accurately address the input costs, changes in enrollment and increased spending due to new laws and regulations. The result after 17 years of short-term congressional fixes in 2015 under President Obama, uh, Congress abandoned the flawed policy because of too much instability for doctors. This leads to the final question, our proposed amendments. We appreciate the discussions to date with Dr. Wood and his team, as well as this administration. Our proposed amendments fall into four main areas. First, the office does not treat all healthcare entities equitably, specifically when it comes to providers and payers. Our amendments equalize the, the treatment of payers and providers to ensure consumers and purchasers realize the benefits. Every sector should meet the same standards and be in the same boat, all rowing together. Second, healthcare entities need a predictable and stable pathway to change. Change cannot happen overnight, and the implementation shouldn't jeopardize access to or the quality of care. Third, the office should minimize unintended consequences and prevent perverse incentives. As an example, requiring the office to establish sector-based targets incentivize cost shifting between sectors. Instead, the office should focus on promoting collaboration, not solidifying silos. And finally, there should be additional checks and balances to instill confidence and buy-in from all stakeholders. Our proposed amendments focus on adding an appeals process, greater transparency, and ensuring a more balanced perspective with the advisory committee. We thank the committee members for your time and really do look forward to working with you on this issue. Thank you very much. Blue Shield. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Lauren nolan Tajik, and I'm a senior, um, a senior member of the government relations team. Blue Shield of California is a nonprofit health plan guided by its mission to reimagine health care into a system that is worthy of our family and friends. While Blue Shield represents 4.5 million customers in a state of 40 million residents, we have a goal of ensuring that all Californians have access to health care at an affordable rate. Over the past three years, we've collaborated with providers, business, 
labor groups and consumer groups to create a holistic approach to healthcare here in California in containing costs and also, also bringing healthcare into the digital age. This can be done by leveraging um, whole patient care through a health information exchange as envisioned in AB 1131 by Assemblymember Wood and through this cost containment proposal in front of you, which we support as we think it takes concrete steps in addressing rising health costs in California. It's no secret that health costs are unsustainable here in the state and that health costs are outstripping wage growth. Um, it's also clear that the current system that we have is not comprehensive enough to hold all cost drivers accountable in the state. Health plans represent up to 20% of premium dollars are subject to federal and state oversight, uh, multiple agency regulation and rate review when it comes to cost. The other approximately 80% of this calculation of costs doesn't have the same transparency or review process. Premiums are a reflection of cost to the system, whether that's from insurers, hospitals, providers, or drug prices. Greater transparency and oversight into the system as a whole under the Office of Healthcare Affordabil Affordability means cost saving to the consumers, whether that be a reduction in premiums or slower rate increases. Um, the longest any example we have of this is from the state of Massachusetts. Since their implementation of their version of the Office of Healthcare Affordability, they have seen its healthcare spending annual growth rates decline from among the highest in the nation to the fourth lowest, generating up to $7.2 billion in avoided commercial spending between 2013 and 2018. So, yes, health plans will definitely be subject to more oversight under this proposal. Um, but, however, under the framework of the Office of Healthcare Affordability, all cost drivers will be under that oversight and greater transparency, which we think really will lead to lower costs in the system. Ultimately, this proposal is creating a public platform to really look at cost trends, drivers of those trends, and strategies to bring those trends down. And we think that that transparency, oversight, and public platform will really promote change here in California and help us provide Californians access to high quality health care at a sustainable rate. Um, so thank you for this opportunity and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Janice with CMA. Thank you, Madam Chair. Janice Ronco, Vice President of Healthcare Access and Coverage on behalf of the nearly 50,000 members of the California Medical Association. Uh, CMA is supportive of efforts to curb costs within the healthcare system, increase competition, reduce administrative complexities, and increase care coordination. We do have concerns with the proposal and have asked for amendments in a number of areas. First, the definition of provider in the proposal is overly broad. It would include all physician practices. We've asked for amendments to narrow the definition of provider in order to focus on the real cost drivers and to reduce administrative burdens on physician practices. There are various economic studies that indicate that healthcare costs in California are driven largely by the consolidated healthcare market in which health the health insurance market is highly concentrated and as such is a cost setter. And more than two thirds of counties in California, the hospital market is considered highly concentrated according to the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission guidelines. Uh, cost targets that apply to all physician practices are overly burdensome on entities that don't have the market power to set provider rates, and they're inconsistent with how other states have handled similar efforts. Uh, two studies were released today that show that when hospitals acquire physician practices, costs increase, and um, done incorrectly, a proposal in this vein um, could lead to more situations of smaller practices being gobbled up by others. Um, another issue is that when cost containment is the sole focus when you're setting the cost targets, when quality um, and access aren't actually a part of the target setting as, as in the bill currently, um, they're not. They're a separate um, part of the bill where they're part of a report but not part of the cost setting. Um, you can inadvertently harm quality and access. Uh, CMA supports Medi-Cal expansion to for instance, undocumented populations. And we understand that there are short-term increased costs of providing care to those who have lacked access to health care, um, and no provider should be penalized for serving a newly insured population. We want to make sure that the ultimate product here 
takes into account quality, equity, and access. CMA also believes that who makes the decision about the cost target matters. We support putting this critical decision in the hands of a statewide elected official, whether that be the governor or the insurance commissioner. Experience tells us that having one appointee who's not directly accountable to the voters is not the ideal way to go. Under a prior administration that was less focused on health care than the current administration, we saw first with health insurance rate review that the elected insurance commissioner, who had far fewer covered lives in the policies that he regulated, than the Department of Managed Healthcare was able to save consumers and businesses far more money in premium savings than the Department of Managed Healthcare. We saw it again with health insurance merger approvals where the elected insurance commissioner worked with the Obama administration and was successful at preventing mergers that would have increased healthcare costs in California while the Department of Managed Healthcare either approved the mergers um, or took no position on them. Those mergers were ultimately blocked by the courts, consistent with what the insurance commissioner was arguing for. The system we build here needs to last beyond the current administration. Um, there are also some timing issues, and we think that the APC, APCD needs to be up and running before the state would be in a position to finalize um, what we should be consider, considering and setting the cost targets. Uh, CMA looks forward to continuing to work with the legislature, the administration, and stakeholders to build solutions that will drive costs down for consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bogle. Um, okay, we'll move on with uh, Dennis O'Malley, please, with the labor fit. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Working on the mute button. Uh, hello, Chair Eggman and committee members. My name is Janice O'Malley, and I am a legislative advocate for the California Labor Federation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak towards issue three, the Office of Healthcare Affordability. The Office of Affordability is a culmination of years of work on behalf of labor and stakeholders who have made many attempts through the legislative process to control the skyrocketing cost of healthcare. All this work has led us to this point of taking a strategic, data-driven approach to analyze the healthcare system in the state to get at the root problem of affordability, quality, access, and equity. In California, health insurance premiums for employer coverage increased by 249% between 2002 and 2017, six times the rate of inflation. For years, our members have foregone wage increases in collective bargaining to maintain affordable, high-quality health coverage, usually with major financial consequences. Many of our bargaining disputes with employers are tied directly to employers trying to shift the rising cost of health care onto workers in the form of higher premiums and higher deductibles and co-pays. This is not a sustainable way to do business. A handful of states, including Massachusetts, Maryland, Rhode Island, and Oregon, have started to address the healthcare affordability crisis by taking a comprehensive look at the whole healthcare system. These models serve as evidence that systems that set statewide targets for reducing rates, increasing cost transparency, and supporting evidence-based data collection can and will help consumers, employers, workers, and taxpayers. The Office of Healthcare Affordability is an important step in addressing the soaring cost of healthcare for Californians. However, we remain concerned about the ability to protect the jobs of our healthcare workforce at the expense of cost containment. Healthcare jobs are good middle class jobs with highly skilled and valued professionals. Oftentimes, cost cutting provisions means that workers' jobs are targeted as a cost savings measure, which leads to short staffing high turnover, and lower quality of care. We are working closely with the administration as well as Assemblymember Wood's office in strengthening language that respects collective bargaining agreements while also making sure that the office adjusts the healthcare cost targets or its approaches as needed to ensure that the healthcare workforce, workforce is strengthened by this proposal. And to the committee's question on how the office would impact workers' access to affordable healthcare coverage in the state, California's working families face serious affordability challenges on all fronts due to the pandemic, from housing, food, transportation, childcare, and other basic life necessities. 
the rising cost of health care is unsustainable and continues to be an ongoing national and state problem. Low and moderate income workers and consumers are especially hard, hit hard with the high cost of care. Such health care costs are further contributing to health care inequality as workers forgo wage increases to pay for increasing premiums, deductibles, and co-pays that fund the health care system. According to the UC Berkeley Labor Center, workers with job-based coverage and their employers will spend an estimated $158 billion on premiums and out-of-pocket costs in 2021. Employer contributions to premiums ultimately come out of workers' pockets as they, part, as they are part of workers' total compensation. If we do not address the issue of high costs, combined spending could reach $206 billion by 2034. By implementing a mechanism that would curtail the rising cost of care and sharing those cost savings with the workers who have been paying into the system, we believe the creation of the office would result in meaningful financial relief to taxpayers, employers, and our members. With lower premiums and out-of-pocket costs, the state has the potential to save tens of billions of dollars. In fact, the same analysis from UC Berkeley's Labor uh, Center that I cited earlier estimates that it would be $42 billion in savings. We look forward to continuing our work with the committee, the author, and the administration in this delicate balance of cost containment that protects workers in the healthcare workforce as well as consumers and patients in the state. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Yasmin Pellet, is it Pellet? Yes, with, thank you so much. Uh -huh. Health good Access. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Yasmin Pellet with Health Access California, the statewide healthcare consumer advocacy coalition. We are here today in support of creating the Office of Healthcare Affordability. Every California consumer with private health insurance is being hit by the rising cost of healthcare, paying higher premiums, deductibles, and copays, and feeling the impact of stagnating wages. Too many consumers forego care because they cannot afford it, giving prescriptions, doctor's visits, lab tests, or other necessary care. The Office of Healthcare Affordability aims to take a holistic approach at containing healthcare costs, resulting from years of negotiations and engaging industry stakeholders about what can work. The office would set enforceable cost targets for the entire healthcare industry and have the ability to levy financial penalties or other corrective action if an entity exceeds the target. The targets would be set by sector and would take into account regional variation, recognizing the differences and complexities in California's healthcare system. Unlike rate setting, which determines how much a doctor's visit or a hospital stay is, the target serves as an overall goal that the industry must meet, but provides the flexibility to achieve it in a way that works best. While all parts of the healthcare industry would be subject to the office and the cost targets, currently some parts of the industry undergo more scrutiny than others. For instance, California has an extensive and robust rate review program for health plans and health insurance, which has provided a wealth of information and over $300 million in savings for consumers. However, for providers like medical groups and hospitals, there's much less oversight and understanding of the cost drivers. Right now, we have specific agencies over specific parts of the industry, but no agency tasked with looking at the entire healthcare sector, much less setting goals for affordability, quality, and equity. And we will never meet a goal that we don't set. Turning to the committee's questions, we believe that the proposed office would have broad impacts for consumers in California. First, and most importantly, recent analyses from both the California Healthcare Foundation and the UC Berkeley Labor Center show that using an approach like the office could save billions of dollars, resulting in lower premiums and out-of-pocket costs for consumers and workers. On the second question, it is important to remember that at the end of the day, consumers are the ones paying the bills. If hospitals and medical groups raise their prices, the insurers just raise premiums or increase cost sharing. Employers may take out of wages or increase share of premium or deductibles for workers. One result has been the growth of high deductible health plans, exposing consumers to extremely high costs, often thousands of dollars of exposure before coverage even kicks in. The data shows again and again that the main cost driver in healthcare is not high utilization, but higher prices. And those high prices are not correlated with more care or better care. 
While the healthcare industry has gotten very sophisticated on how it can maximize profits for executives and shareholders, the office will focus the industry on how to provide real affordability to Californians. For these reasons, we are pleased to propose to support this proposed Office of Healthcare Affordability. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Director. Sorry I went out of order, but maybe it's nice for you to come back now and be able to do your presentation about why this is important. I think you've heard from the advocates. They like it. And the providers, not so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. And everyone got a break from hearing from me, and I got to have a drink of water. So <laughs> happy to provide an update on, on where we are on the Office of Healthcare Affordability proposal, which we acknowledge that the committee previously heard in February. Um, so just to note that we have not yet modified the administration's trailer bill language, but as noted, we've been collaborating with Assemblymember Wood's office and talking to stakeholders about the proposed office. Um, so these conversations are under uh, are ongoing, but I'm happy to talk about some of the changes that have been made um, in the bill as a result of the conversations. So um, we've heard a lot um, early on about concerns about the reporting timeline, uh, in part due to the impacts of the pandemic. So folks have we, we've heard loud and clear that the impact the pandemic has had on the healthcare system. So in terms of the data and the years that we were looking to, we're proposing to have um, data collected for 2020, 2019, 2020, and 2021 to really try to look at the, what the impact of the pandemic was in terms of the total cost of care data. There wouldn't be any enforcement associated with this initial data set or with the baseline data. So we're looking to push out um, so that the years 2022 and 2023 would establish the baseline um, and OSHPED would report on this data um, in 2025. The first year that there would be um, a measurement against a cost target would be for 2024 data. And then the first time there would be sector specific targets would be 2027. So all that to say is we've heard from folks you know, pandemic data is not, um, shouldn't be the baseline. And so we've pushed all of those timeframes out. We've heard a variety of types of feedback about the composition of the advisory board and have agreed with adding two more members to bring the total number of members of the advisory board to 11. Um, one member would explicitly represent a purchaser of healthcare coverage or benefits with experience in health delivery financing, management or administration, and we're also looking to add um, the CalPERS chief health director or their designee. Um, on the healthcare cost targets, we've agreed with clarifying that the OSHPED director can adjust cost targets by geographic region, sub-region, sub -region, um, and sectors. In the event that the OSHPED director determines a cost target should differ from the cost target rec recommended by the board, the director would have to issue a public report on an alternate cost target, demonstrating that the alternate target would result in greater savings to healthcare consumers than that set by the board without reducing the quality of care. We've also heard concerns relayed about the enforcement approach. So really want to be clear that the um, enforcement approach of the office would be um, very progressive in nature. Um, we would seek to assist healthcare entities to come into compliance, including through outreach, technical assistance, and corrective action plans before administrative penalties, unless the violation is egregious. An example of egregious violation that would merit administrative penalties would be repeated failure to file a corrective action plan, for example, or repeated failure to implement um, a corrective, corrective action plan. For investments in primary care and behavioral health, we also agree with requiring the spending benchmarks for primary care to consider current and former underfunding of primary care services, an issue raised by um, the stakeholders. And on healthcare workforce stability, we agree that in pursuing affordability, we would recognize the need to both maintain and increase the supply of healthcare workers and to respect collective bargaining agreements. We also agree with the clarifications as to what the office's role would be with respect to consolidation, making clear the distinction between the office and those that have existing jurisdictions in those areas. 
So uh, this is summarizes some of the issues we've worked out, um, which I think reflects a lot of engagement um, by all of the parties represented here today, as well as others. And again, really want to stress that they, there are ongoing discussions. Legislative engagement is critical to the success of the office, and we're grateful to be here to listen to your feedback and to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, can we go to the Department of Finance? Hi, no comment. Thank you. Thank you. The LAO? Hey, thank you, Senator Eggman. Uh, Corey Ishida again from the LAO. I'll be very brief again. Um, we just have a few brief comments on this proposal. Generally, you know, we don't have major concerns to raise, just a few, you know, considerations to, to bring up going forward. Um, you know, we find that the establishment of this office, which, you know, generally has the goal of containing escalating health care costs across the state, makes sense in concept um, as a method to respond to the state's affordability issues. Um, you know, we would note that this proposal includes a very substantial resource request, you know, eventually ramping up to over 120 positions and about $27 million in a few years. Um, and that this office is likely going to be very administratively complex to implement. Um, there are a multitude of entities, as discussed earlier, in our healthcare system, be, their provider, be they providers or, or payers. And this office is going to need to determine, you know, what information to collect and what targets these entities will need to meet, um, which is going to be a very significant lift. Um, you know, as such, you know, going forward, the legislature may want to monitor sort of the progress toward fully implementing um, this proposed office's duties going forward. You know, this could include checking in with some degree of regularity on whether the level of administrative resources attached to this proposal are, are appropriate. Um, you know, this would be especially helpful given that, you know, the administration is to some extent basing its resource request for this proposal on activities in another state, um, which may not be directly comparable to, to California's situation. So that, that's um, all of our comments on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and Director, I would ask, um, I mean, I think we probably all, all we all see the the uh, the need for something like this. And, and uh, uh, in my earlier conversations with Dr. Wood, that's one of the questions I asked, like, what, what took us so long to get here? Because I think it's an important place and a, an important conversation to be having. But of course, it's, you know, it's always in, in getting it done. Um, can you speak a little bit about, and I know, and I know we're talking also about the issue of, of, uh, of access and equity, um, but when we talk about uh, setting different targets for different regions around the state, one of the issues, of course, we have is not having enough health care providers in, in more rural areas and in more areas where um, maybe the quality of living isn't quite as glamorous or, or, or the pay is not quite as high. Um, can you talk about then how do how do we make sure that we maintain uh, uh, providers in all areas of California as we really look going towards cost containment? Um, how are we making sure we balance uh, regional equity uh, as well as cost containment? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think it's a critical issue and one that we didn't hear about as much today, but want to be very clear again that the purpose of the office is um, not to have a race to the bottom, right? We don't want to control costs by putting additional pressure on the system such that we lose providers, quite the opposite. So as you noted, we do have components that look to measure quality um, and equity, and we want to leverage the work being done by, by Medi-Cal and um, Covered California and DMHC and, and others in terms of quality and equity metrics. And then in terms of primary care and your specific question, the office would specifically measure and promote a, a baseline spend on primary and behavioral health. So there's a lot of research showing that there needs to be enough investment in primary care and behavioral health, and that that investment in turn helps bring down costs. And so we would be looking at that um, on a regional basis to, to try to address exactly the question that you, the concern that you pose. Okay, thank you. Um... I'm going to ask Dr. Pan to go. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have quite a few questions. I appreciate this. Um, and I appreciate the presentation. Um, and uh, I guess uh, I would just, first of all, um, start off by saying, you know, my conflict of interest is, is that I'm a physician and I take care of people when they're sick. Uh, I also try to prevent disease as well. In fact, as a pediatrician, that's where I spend most of my time. But I also acknowledge that 
probably from a spending point of view, it's the people who actually um, have health care needs. In fact, uh, let's remember that people with chronic disease uh, spend about 70 to 80 percent of our health care costs. Um, they're about 40 percent of Californians. Uh, so as we try to cap off costs, just keep in mind who we're talking about. And in fact, the sickest 10 percent spend about two thirds of all health care spending. So, um, so just, again, a reminder of who we're impacting um, and their access to care as well. I also think it's interesting, I, I do note that in the testimony, um, we talked a little bit about um, Medicare and some of the uh, challenges that Medicare has faced um, in terms of their payment. Uh, the SGR was a failed attempt by Congress to tie payments to uh, essentially the GDP. and. Uh, over uh, several years, in fact, over more than a decade, that became a disaster, and finally Congress had to step in and fix that um, because it was it was an attempt to try to quote make you know things more affordable or to s limit spending, but because it inaccurately tied it to an economic data marker that was not related to actual healthcare needs, it certainly caused all sorts of problems. The other thing, actually, uh, pr uh, apropos, was is uh, regarding uh, payment rates as well for different regions. Uh, in Medicare, actually, they established regions when Medicare was established. Interestingly enough, Sacramento at the time, I know some people call us a cow town. I don't think we're a cow town. But uh, you know, we were considered rural, actually, when Medicare was established. And in fact, um, the problem was is that the reimbursement rates for areas like Sacramento, even though as we became more urbanized and, uh, and actually cost of practice went up, we were still reimbursement-wise for Medicare pinned to being the uh, same as the other communities that didn't reflect our, the cost of uh, practice. So again, I think regional adjustments are going to be important, but we also need to reflect, the, and I appreciate the chair bringing up, uh, the issue of uh, often what happens is that someone does some cost analysis and says, oh, yeah, rural practice is, quote, cheaper because, you know, generally, you know, uh, rental costs, other types of expenses are, are perhaps less, but then that becomes a disincentive for people to, to go into practice uh, in those areas. So that will be, have to be monitored carefully. Um, but I guess the first question I have, and I appreciate the director uh, mentioning on several occasions, you know, talking to uh, Dr. Wood, who is carrying a bill, um, uh, but um, we're the Senate here, so there's two houses of the legislature. I happen to chair the health committee in the Senate, and uh, so I haven't had many conversations at all with uh, Director Lansbury about this. Uh, when am I going to hear from you about a detailed policy discussion in regards to this, and is the plan of the administration to simply implement this through the budget, or, or is Dr. Wood's, uh, Assemblymember Wood's uh, bill going to be the vehicle, and so we're going to have a full policy discussion uh, here in the Senate as well in the Senate Committee on Health. So can you please tell me what the administration's intentions are? Uh, so, well, Senator Pan, as you know, this is a budget proposal. Uh, it, it is a January budget proposal, and there is the parallel uh, policy bill, as, as you reference. And so at this point, it's up to the legislature and the process to work its way through as, as to which vehicle moves. Okay. Well, uh, yes, it, it is the legislature in the end that will decide. Uh, but what is the preference of the administration? We do not have a stated preference at, the, at this time, Senator. Okay, so uh, um, so I, I guess I would make note then is that um, certainly we would want a policy vetting of this uh, proposal in the Senate, uh, so which whichever through whatever venue. Um, what is the current state of the proposal? Because I understand that uh, Senator Woods' bill at the time it uh, passed out of the Committee on Health in the Assembly was described mainly as a work in progress. I uh, hear you say there's still even though you did cite a few things that were happening, it's still a work in progress. My understanding from talking to staff in the subcommittee that, it, that there's still a lot of missing pieces. Uh, at what point in time will we have a full proposal so we could do a full policy vetting? So in terms of, I don't want to speak for, for Assembly Member Wood, um, we, although sure. we have been talking to his office um, as well as talking to stakeholders. So, uh, as you noted, there were some uh, amendments that were taken in, in policy committee, and my understanding is there may be a additional amendments being taken um, in appropriations, and we are working to try to sort through all of the policy issues that have been raised as quickly as possible. Okay. So, uh, I guess I want to know is when should I expect, since I also sub sit on this subcommittee as well as chair of the health committee, when can I expect a full policy proposal to review? Um, 
prior to being expected to vote on it, whether it's in policy or in, whether it's in the budget subcommittee or in uh, policy committee. Uh, as noted, Senator, we are we are working um, as quickly as we can to try to resolve all the issues. I don't have an exact date for you, but certainly note um, the, the need to try to resolve the, the, pen, the, the remaining okay. issues. So do I have a commitment from you to have a conversation with me as chair of the Health Committee in the Senate? Uh, of course. To, uh, to, uh, about before uh, this before this comes up for a vote in, in the legislature, whether it's in budget or in in in, in the Senate Health Committee. Of course, Senator Pan. Okay. All right. Um, I do have several questions to help me flesh out at least some of the policy issues here. Um, so, you know, you, you referenced there were uh, certain, um, you know, dates for spending targets, including consequences for those. What kind of data does your, does the, the administration or your uh, now department, I guess when you name it as a department, I was going to say office, uh, would, uh, do you feel would be required in order to appropriately establish evidence-based spending targets? So we seek to collect um, data on the total cost of care. And so that is both accessing data that's available um, through, through research entities now, but it's really, it's primarily collecting data from the payers. Um, as you, uh, the total cost of care includes um, premium payments, so, so the, as you know, the APCD, our, our HPD database program, is primarily looking at claims, and the Office of Healthcare Affordability, in, in gathering the total cost of care data, will look, in addition to claims paid, um, will also look at administrative costs, premium payments, co-pays that are made by um, the, the consumers, and we'll look at both claims and non-claims payments. Okay. So we'll look so, at so, so that, that, okay, payments. So, so that's on the payment side. And what is, what is the current status of the uh, All Players Claims database? Is it up and running fully? Are you fully collecting? Or when, when do you expect that to happen? Bye. It is not fully up and running. And I'm going to see if Mike Valley can, can jump in and answer some questions about exactly when we'll have all that data. But just to note, mm -hmm. as, as you and I discussed in February, we don't need all of the data from the, from the uh, HPD in order to uh, capture the total cost well, of when, care. When, when did you expect all the data? Mike Valley, are you there? I, I, I am here. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Director Landsberg, and, and thank you, Senator Pam, for, for the question. Uh -huh. Uh, re regarding the, the health care payments uh, database implementation, uh, California's all-payer claims database, we are on track and, and making progress to substantially complete the database by July 1, 2023, as prescribed in, in, in statute. We're, we're working very closely with, with stakeholders, uh, as well as colleagues at the California Department of Technology on, on the detailed implementation okay. timeline for the database itself. Uh, and then we're also on track to promulgate regulations for data collection currently under development and will be in place December 31st, 2021. So we would expect to have at least three years of historical data available when uh, the database is substantially complete July 2023. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I, I would make note that while there, while, while it said that you don't need all of the information, I would expect you need a substantial portion of this information. So that's, that, that is, and then someone needs to take a look at it. So just collecting the data, data analysis takes time as well. So there's fairly brief time between January, uh, July 1st, 2023 and 2024. Uh, so aside from this payment data, um, you know, healthcare is about health. So um, aside from the payment data, what, what other inputs are you looking for that you think are required to establish a spending target? Um, well, as you know, we, we will be collecting data on, on quality and equity, um, and so we, we will want to do that in tandem before there is any enforceable cost target that is set. And, and what kind of, um, I mean, can you, so for example, quality data, what kind of quality data are you looking for that you, that you need to collect? So we want to leverage existing efforts um, to not unnecessarily duplicate. So I know the sure. next item you're hearing is about DMHC's proposal to set quality and, and equity metrics. We also understand that there are efforts underway with Medi-Cal, with Covered California, with CalPERS. So we will um, have a subset of our staff um, and researchers that are looking at a set of quality data um, again, wanting to uh, leverage existing uh, mm -hmm. selected uh, measures 
but okay. we need to have those in place so that we can make sure that quality is not negatively impacted okay. as we impose the, the okay. cost targets. No, I, 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 no, I appreciate that. I, I think one note as someone who's also done research in quality improvement uh, is, is that quality data is, of course, most usually available in diseases that are uh, fairly widespread, uh, that there's a lot of people who have it because certainly it's a lot easier to collect. It gets more challenging when you talk about rare conditions, when there's a much smaller percentage of people um, uh, that uh, they're, uh, and, and so for example, when you look at uh, NCQA or you look at uh, HEDA, you know, the, the, these various data sets, HEDA is of course based on administrative data. Um, you know, it's, well, certainly those can be helpful. And if you look at conditions like asthma or diabetes, they usually you have, again, large numbers. When you start talking about smaller numbers, although cumulatively, if you add all the small, all the small number of conditions all together, it start, actually starts to become a fairly large number. Uh, but the quality data is much more challenging. And as someone who's actually been involved in uh, doing quality data analysis, I think hopefully is that something that's going to be acknowledged by uh, in, in, in the studies of these task forces that we're not overly focused just on the conditions that uh, that uh, obviously they do have a larger impact on on spending, but the other ones cumulatively also have a significant impact on spending. Yes, yeah, Senator. So this is obviously an area that you have a lot of important expertise, and so we do plan to bring it. You know, work off of. The, the most effective models. And then so I think your point is very well taken that um, it's important to look at widespread diseases like like diabetes and other chronic conditions as well as as less frequent but but very impactful conditions okay. as well. So I just make note that there may not be data at you know there, there may be data voids, okay, because again, it's hard to collect data on these smaller conditions. I'm not saying that uh, and I, I think so you need to be sure there's enough flexibility to deal with the data void issue uh, that you don't simply say, oh, because there's no data, therefore we don't have to, uh, or we, you know, the spending part, uh, we basically zero out or, uh, or, or underestimate. So I just want to point that out. And then certainly equity, uh, which I know we'll hear from DMHC, so, uh, oftentimes similar issues are in place because um, the very same people who have less access to healthcare oftentimes have less access to people actually studying how well they're doing, unfortunately. And uh, so, if, uh, again, an equity framework, I think it's important to recognize. So I would make note that as someone who's uh, Asian, who, who rep chairs the API caucus and who is uh, Asian, that uh, actually I think only a very small fraction of studies, if you go look at the literature, published literature, actually include API as a category mm -hmm. that they studied. We're usually not there. We don't exist. And yet our community, which represents 16% of California, we're going to be counting on you not to make us disappear, even though the research data isn't there, because people don't study us. And I hope I can count on you to not do that to us. Absolutely. Community. Thank you for flagging that as okay. well. Okay. So again, I said data voids. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue I actually want to ask you about is um, the advisory board, and it was brought up, but what, can you speak to the independence of the uh, advisory board to, you know, I'm, I'm an elected official, so certainly we're responsible to the voters, and I believe that people need to be accountable, uh, but we also think that there is some argument that they shouldn't be overly um, uh, influenced by political, influ you know, directly, with, they, they should be driven by evidence and data. So can you speak to what is the independence of the advisory board from, let's say, the governor or other elected uh, uh, bodies? Certainly, Senator Pan. So the current um, proposed structure that we put forward does have the advisory board being primarily appointed by the governor's office, the Senate, and the Assembly with a, f a few ex officio Members. So do they have um, do they have fixed terms where they cannot be? Are they serving at will? Are they uh, actually once they're appointed, they have sufficient terms and they're not subject to uh, dismissal unless obviously if they com commit some egregious act or something? So is there that level of independence? I believe there are fixed terms. Yes. Okay. All right. I would certainly again one of those policy things that I would uh, appreciate the discussion about. And then did th th come up with the f definition of a provider. And again, I haven't seen the specifics. Um, so, um, and it was mentioned by CMA that, for example, a solo practice doctor would be considered a provider. Um, is, so, can, first of all, can you tell me that's true? And then let's say a dentist. Is a dentist a provider under this definition? So it would fall under the same thing. 
And then finally, a chiropractor, would they also fall under the definition as well? So can you, so individual, solo practice, physician, independent practice, dentist, and then chiropractor. Would all sure, three fall just, under definition? Uh, as to your last point, I just want to clarify that yes, the, the advisory board members would serve um, for four years, so wanted to put that out there. In terms of whether a single practitioner would be subject to the cost target, um, no, they certainly would not. Um, the, the bill that we released in the trailer bill language that the administration released in early February leaves open the definition of a healthcare entity that would be subject to the cost target. We were going to leave that up to regulations. Um, we so understand no... that it's very important to the California Medical Association well, well, and others I mean... that that definition be be um, set in statute. And so we are currently working um, on what the number how large of a practice should be included um, in the definition of, of healthcare entity. Okay, and then, and then um, so, so that CMA represents doctors. What about dentists and chiropractors? Yeah. Um, and they could be in groups I, too. They're not, you know, they're not all solo. So, you know, you have small groups, you even have large, uh, you even have large, group or, large groups of those entities as well. So, you know. I do not believe we plan to include dentists. Um, and we, again, will we'll have additional definition of, of exempted um, regulation, exempted providers in the, in the regulations. Um, so the lines of business will be identified. I, I don't, for, the HPD, for example, we've chosen not to start, not to include dentistry um, at the outset, um, and nor, nor chiropractors. Okay. Okay. And, uh... And I would make note that billions are spent in alternative medicine. In fact, sometimes uh, they cause delays in care that can cause increased expenses. Uh, is that going to be also uh, under the oversight of this uh, of this body? Uh, that is a substantial portion of healthcare spending. Um, currently, the definition of the total cost of care doesn't include, for example, uh, something that a consumer chose to spend on their own outside of their health okay. coverage. Okay, so, so if it's outside of health yeah. coverage, so therefore, for example, concierge practices would not fall under this? It's a great question, and I'm happy for Mike Valley or, or Ryan Buckley to correct me. I don't think we've reached that level of detail. Okay, so, and, and, and then I guess, and I, I realize, that, but then we start getting to equity issue, right? After all, who can avail themselves? In other words, we're going to create a system where we say, guess what? If you're, not, if you're rich enough, you can buy out. If you're not rich enough, you're stuck under our caps. Correct? Well, concierge payments are above and beyond usual co-pays. Right. Um, OK, well, I, again, I just posed that out there to think about, OK? So thank um, you. yeah, we're talking about people being able to buy themselves out, essentially. OK. Uh, the other issue is is that um, so in terms of uh, other inputs, um, as people are developing these cost targets, um, you know you have again you know the advisory committee. Uh, we know that one driver of healthcare costs is technology. We have changing technology. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is, for example, new diseases. I mean, certainly that hopefully is quite evident to anyone right now as we are facing COVID <laughs> and coronavirus. You know, we had HIV before and so forth. Um, how, how, and then, so how, how do you see the advisory committee making adjustments when you have uh, unprojected, and I, by the way, I did workforce projections before in my re previous research as, uh, before I came into the legislature. Uh, so uh, oftentimes, again, these are places where uh, your, your plan, you know, best plans go awry. But if you don't do things right, then you suddenly say, guess what? We don't need more ID doctors, and then HIV starts showing up, and then what kind of impact that has on, uh, on, on populations. So how, how are we going to account for technology, which is maybe somewhat a little more predictable, and new diseases, and trying, to project, and trying to establish these kind of spending targets to be sure that we don't deny care or under-resource care for, for populations that may be particularly vulnerable to these uh, conditions? Yes, yeah, Senator Pan. So it is one reason that we're interested in collecting the data on the current pandemic years um, as some point of comparison. Who knows um, what what will be coming our way? So we think that will be important baseline data as well as to hopefully have um, if we if we get back to a, a new normal in 2022, 2023, have have that baseline data. Um, we certainly think there will be, you know, we, we would 
I think it's important as the advisory board looks to set the cost target to allow for the increase, hopefully is going to exactly what we would want it to go to um, that would actually improve care, which would be um, it, uh, valuable innovations as well as a uh, um, investment in technology. So one of the pieces that the office will also be doing is trying to promote alternative payment methods. Um, and we think those are important vehicles to help incentivize investment um, in, in technology and, and in the most innovative, effective medical strategies. Okay, I appreciate that. I noticed you said the word hopefully. Hopefully is a little scary because hopefully, uh, I think we need to plan for this. We need to have the flexibility, anticipate for this. This We need to ensure that the advisory committee is responsive to this, that they don't, uh, that they're not, in, not, not unresponsive to this. So hopefully it's more than hopefully. So I said hopefully because Maybe I should say that we should insist uh, that uh, we are correct for this. Uh, and then certainly one part that should be very predictable is the aging population and increasing demand for that. So uh, as we look at health uh, targets, I mean, that's one reason why spending is going to be faster than inflation, because the population is not going to be the same next year. It's a year older. And while, yes, we do have people dying at one end and people being born at the other, we know that the overall age, average age of our population is increasing over, uh, over time and that, uh, and that as they're doing the, the costs targets uh, that we need to adjust for that. The other thing I make note is I, I you know, heard the testimony and, it's, and I know it's commonly said that, oh, you know, we spend 30% of a health care costs are unnecessary. Uh, but I would make note that as in my conversations with the uh, uh, previous Secretary Dooley, uh, uh, the challenge is finding which 30%, right? I mean, when you actually start looking at individual cases, so I know it's commonly thrown out there, but I haven't seen a study which actually has been able to say, okay, here's the 30%, that's the wasteful part, right? Um, because when you push comes to shove and people try to find it, it's not so easy to find. And then um, the other thing, the other question, you made some reference to this. Okay, so uh, labor costs. Um, uh, we know that many uh, people uh, in healthcare are actually, again, represented uh, by, by unions, which is a good thing. I myself am a member of a labor union. Um, uh, so are we, uh, are, so if an entity actually has a collective bargaining agreement and that leads to an increase in wages and benefits, uh, does that automatically increase their cost target to reflect their increase in labor expenses, especially since 60% of uh, healthcare is labor? So we, there is uh, currently language in Assembly Member Woods' bill that looks to um, having to recognize and collective bargaining changes as as an input to be considered. Just to be considered. Well, as as, as an economic as part of the the economic analysis that's done okay. to evaluate so, the cost target. Okay, so um, I, I just want to be a little. So you you know someone's negotiating. And they're per, I think we need to be clear to the people, to the uh, to the uh, employers who are negotiating, as well as the unions, that um, that doesn't become an excuse for not being able to collectively bargain in good faith, or to uh, to limit uh, because you know then what happens is what you have a collective bargaining unit, you go to advisory committee, you beg the advisory committee, the advisory committee decides, you know, I don't know how many years later, finally, okay, we'll give you an increase because of that, et cetera. And then people say, next collective bargaining uh, uh, cycle, uh, we don't want to go through that again. Uh, so I, I think we need to build in something that's a little more uh, assured uh, for people that, uh, that when there's a uh, you know fair bargaining contract that that needs to be reflected, so that they can get uh, so that uh, that doesn't become a barrier to uh, to negotiating a fair contract. Um, I certainly can ask many many more questions, but I do appreciate your commitment to have a conversation with the Senate uh, and I, as chair of the Senate Health Committee, on the policy issues prior to any vote on this proposal. And, um, and uh, so look forward to perhaps exploring uh, other additional issues. And again, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, Senator Wood's bill has not made it over to the Senate yet. So while you made reference to it, um, aside from the broader outlines, uh, I have not had an opportunity to delve into it more deeply. In fact, uh, probably want to see what the version comes out of appropriations in the assembly. Uh, uh, so I know what I'm working with there, but I appreciate the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Pan. My staff will reach out to your staff this afternoon to set something up. Okay, thank you. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, uh, clearly, there's a lot of interest on this topic um, in both houses, in both houses. So we will certainly look forward to that. Uh, uh, Assemblymember Woods bill making you over to this side for a full policy hearing. Um, but again, just to reiterate the uh, the need I think we all have to really grapple with this issue of affordability, um, both as Dr. Pan said, with our aging population, um, and but then also, as we've spoke before, about making sure we have enough providers. Um, and I guess just the point I want to continue to make is, is that we look at equity uh, across the mm -hmm. state with a lot of attention to our different regions. Um, I, it, with our different regions and that it's, it doesn't exist, providers don't exist in a silo, right? They're working in part of uh, uh, organizations that oftentimes are less resourced and oftentimes are treating people, as Dr. Pan has said before, who have even higher health needs. Um, and it's harder to keep people there, uh, providers there, um, because oftentimes our schools don't reflect uh, the high quality uh, that some folks are looking for when they when they come out of uh, college with a whole lot of debt. So uh, it just needs to be looked at in uh, in conjunction with all the other factors that go into uh, our health outcomes. Because again, as we look at costs, we can't forget about uh, outcomes and what we're really talking about here. Um, and then just to, to say that as somebody who served on the Stockton City Council when we went into the very painful bankruptcy, a lot of that it was due to the mortgage meltdown, but there was also a significant amount related to our, our health care costs. Um, so I certainly hope when we're also talking about these things that we're working in collaboration. I know we've got some folks from labor there, but our local governments up and down the state often are at the uh, on the precipice of not being able to make it with our health care costs. So making sure that we take those things into uh, consideration also. Um, because we know that just maintains a good, healthy workforce and, and government workers and, and servants if we're able to uh, pay people properly and have uh, adequate health benefits. Okay. And with that, I think we'll move on. And thank, thank you, you very Senator much, Eggman. Director. Okay. Now we are moving on to issue number... Uh, or to Department of Managed Health Care. All right, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yes, great. So I'm Mary Watanabe. I'm the director of the Department of Managed Health Care. And I have with me today our Chief Deputy Director, Dan Southard, as well. So we'll start with just a quick overview of our proposal, the Annual Health Care Service Plan Health Equity and Quality Reviews. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed long